So we go over sleep habits, exercise, diet and hydration, stress reduction. I will give them a prescription with mindfulness uh, links and apps and exercises and things and, and give them all of the sleep hygiene um, and kind of building up on very gradual walks, like starting for 10 or 15 minutes around the block and you build it up by five minutes every month. Um, and patients are very, I think, responsive to this. Um, so I've seen really good uptake in the lifestyle modification and then they may not need their medication as much. If you want to review a great article that delves into this, uh, there's a SEEDS model, which, which addresses all these things, and it's by uh, Jen Robley and Amal Starling, um, and I, I'll have the reference in the slides. Too. So nutraceuticals, we need a whole other talk. This is what I was talking about, like easing people into harder medicines that they may be apprehensive about. Um, starting them with some of the stuff, you know, I didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there's a lot of good things that comes out of uh, more natural or alternative medicine, but you want to back it up with evidence. And these are the ones that have good quality evidence for migraine. So I will often recommend magnesium or uh, vitamin D, CoQ10, riboflavin. Um, and again, here's a good summary of those if you want to delve into the data. Other devices, like we mentioned, they can be used both in acute and preventive options, and they represent a nice way to avoid medicines. Um, and like I mentioned, there's a talk available on YouTube uh, from Migraine Canada about this. So for a long while, you know, these patients were wandering through the desert, you know, trying out one medicine after another with all sorts of horrible side effects. And, you know, they had to, we knew Botox was useful, but you had to get over three, two to three preventives before you could get there. Um, and so it was a really desperate, frustrating time for a lot of people with migraine. But things have been evolving. And now suddenly we have an explosion of different types of medicines which are available. And because a lot of them are kind of newer technologies like monoclonal antibodies, you know, I think there's an apprehension because the first ones to class like this, these disease modifying biologics, uh, you know, they were things like for MS or rheumatoid, which required blood monitoring and had very serious potential side effects or you know, needed imaging and things. And so I think that may be cause some primary care people to be apprehensive about using these. Um, but the one thing I would emphasize is that they're like exceptionally safe and they're better tolerated than the traditional stuff we're using. So really they're kind of an ideal medication for primary care. So unfortunately, like I think sometimes the pharmacy shop is looking like the hot sauce aisle in Buffalo because there's so many options and they're all very attractive. And how do you determine which one to pick for your patient and give them the best outcome? So. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, arrival of the new monoclonal antibodies. I think this represents a new hope for our migraineurs. And so there's three classes blocking this pathway, like we talked about. There's monoclonal antibodies that block the receptor. There's antibodies that block the ligand, the actual molecule. And then there's the small ones, the GPNs that we talked about that block the receptor. So they block CGRP action, inhibit transmission, and importantly, to reiterate, they are not direct vasoconstrictors. So you know, more likely to be safely used in people with those vascular risk factors. So again, for the sake of time today, I'm presenting the data in aggregate. Um, and because the trials are all different in the way they were designed and executed uh, and analyzed, you can't really make a head-to-head -head comparison, but it gives you a rough estimate. So looking at CGRP monoclonal antibodies in episodic migraine, uh, we have three main ones, irenumab, galcanizumab, and fremenizumab. Um, and you know, these patients had kind of lower frequency. They're kind of on the cusp between high and low frequency episodic migraine. And so baseline days range is somewhere between eight to nine uh, for all these trials. And you know, a 50% reduction is, is kind of an easy, good rule of thumb to like explain to a patient. I think it's very intuitive. You know, like you can say how many patients, like what percentage of patients cut their headaches in half. You know, and I think that's very easy to understand instead of like some of the more abstract ways we were measuring it before. And so for Arenumab, kind of the, the flagship one that started first. Um, we were seeing 50% reduction in somewhere between, uh, you know, 40 to 50% of patients. For galcanizumab, it was a little bit better, uh, maybe up to 60% there, and fremenizumab, 44 to 47. And so we kind of averaged out, and people were saying from this trial data that, you know, maybe 50% of people cut their headaches in half, and then maybe 25% cut their headaches by 75%. Um, but, you know, I think, again, it's important to remember that in a clinical trial, patients are very carefully selected and they tend to have frequencies of headache on the lower end of the spectrum and they exclude a lot of the more complicated patients that have other things going on or like continuous opioid use or other chronic pain conditions.